This is um, one of my honors to be able to welcome the speaker at our annual uh, Driggs Lecture. This is the 100th anniversary of the ending of World War I. And I was meeting with a class earlier today, and I said, you need to all come <clears throat> because you don't know anything about World War I, except that it came before World War II. Um, we have, um, and I didn't pick up the name of the individual that brought a World War I uniform. Uh, whose uniform is this? Thank you so much. So this is your grandfather's uniform from World War I. So before you leave, you may want to take a quick look at that. That's exciting. Uh, we want to thank Camille Bradford and uh, the Driggs family um, for their support of this uh, series and for always giving us so much of their time and resources. Uh, it's my privilege to, to introduce to you our speaker, Dr. Jennifer Keene. Um, Jennifer Keene is a specialist in the American military experience during World War I. And since this year marks the 100th anniversary, um, the American military experience is something particularly interesting to us. She's a professor of history, chair of the history department at Chapman University in Orange, California. She is the current president of the Society of Military History and has published three books and numerous articles on Americans' involvement in World War I. She's received numerous awards, including Fulbright Senior Scholar Awards to France and to Austria, and a Mellon Library of Congress Fellowship in International Studies. She's one of our country's foremost experts on World War I, and it's our honor to have you here today, Dr. King. She, I've actually had a class from her. Um, in the not-so-distant past, I'm confident that you will enjoy uh, listening to her. So, Dr. King. Thanks very much. Great. Well, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to come and talk to you about one of my absolute favorite topics, the American experience in the First World War, and also for the hospitality that I've had here. It's an, uh, I had an amazing day yesterday. Um, visiting with students, teaching a class, uh, seeing the campus, you, the students here, you, you are so lucky um, to go to school at this university. It's been really, really just an amazing pleasure to learn more. So my topic today is the American experience in the First World War. And as your president suggested, often people don't really know that much about the First World War, certainly about the American experience. But even if you don't know that much, I'm sure you've seen this poster. Right. This poster, and there's a reason for that, there were five million of them published in America during the First World War. They were widely distributed, distributed, and of course they became the template for many, uh, many uh, copies in the future with different slogans on them. And I wanted to start with this poster because it helps us understand something really unique about the American experience uh, right from the start of my remarks today. And that is that the First World War starts in 1914, but the United States does not enter the war until April of 1917. And so that means that we are coming into the war very late, and our entry into the war has many differences from the way Europe goes to war. The first big difference is that when Europe goes to war in 1914, as many of you may know, they expect a short war. They really think the war is going to be over in about six weeks. So they're taken by surprise when the war turns out to be so much more difficult. The Western Front is established, and they end up in a real trench stalemate for the next few years. But when America enters in April of 1917, it's with a completely different mindset. The Battle of the Somme has happened, the Battle of Verdun. The United States understands that if it enters this war, it's going to have to mobilize all of its resources. It's going to have to raise a mass army. It's going to have to mobilize the home front. And it expects to be in this war for several years. So America goes in with a very different attitude towards the war. Now, knowing about the war has also created a lot of division on the home front in this period of neutrality. And so there had been, it had been, been very difficult for the president to actually prepare the military for fighting. Any steps that we made to increasing our military were perceived as uh, sort of uh, indirect ways to get us one, close step, one step closer to getting into the war. 
So I'm going to explain to you exactly what I mean. Over the course of the 18 months that the United States is in this conflict, we will raise an army of 4.2 million men. In April of 1917, when we enter the war, how many do we have? 300,000. So in 18 months, we're going to go from 300,000 to 4.2 million men. This is an amazing growth of the military. It has to happen fast in order to be effective. So one of the first decisions that the military has to make, or the government has to make, is how to raise this armed forces. And we love to study history to learn lessons from the past. And the army looks back. It looks at what Britain did. It looks at what we did during the Civil War. And they come to an important decision. And the decision is that unlike in the past, we are not going to raise the majority of this force through volunteers. We are instead going to conscript from the very beginning of the war. And of those 4.2 million men that I'm talking to you about, 72% of those men will be conscripted. And we've never done it like this before. This is brand new. And so the government's worried that in introducing conscription right from the very beginning, when you know that there's been debate over whether we should enter the war, are you, in a sense, telling the American people that this war is so unpopular that the only way we can get men into the army is by forcing them in through conscription? This is the dilemma that the government actually has. So they do a few things to mitigate this impression. They don't ever, for example, call it conscription. And they don't even really call it the draft. They rebrand it. Any business people here? They rebrand it. And what do they call it? They start calling it what we still call it, selective service. Isn't that better? Wouldn't you like to be selected rather than to be forced into the military? So they call it selective service. And they're trying to make the impression that everybody has got a responsibility in this war. If you're selected to serve, that's just one way you're going to serve the war. Because even on the home front, you're going to have a responsibility to actually do your part. Now, the other thing, besides just changing the name, is that they want to change the process by which they actually manage conscription. And they look back at the Civil War. And in the Civil War, you know there had been draft riots in 1863 in the North when the draft had been introduced. And they wanted to avoid some of those mistakes. And in the past, men had actually registered for the draft individually. Either an agent had come to your house, knocked on the door, and you filled out a form, or you mailed in a letter to, to, the, to the government. And what they decided to do in the First World War was something dramatically different. And that was that they were going to instead make registering for the draft a, a day of national celebration. And so there were two days during the First World War in the United States when the whole nation, all men who were of draft eligible, eligible age, would, dra would register for the draft and they would register in public. And so this is a poster that comes from the first National Registration Day, which was June 5th, uh, 1917. And, and Woodrow Wilson is kind of a little washed out here, but he actually says a great day of patriotic devotion and obligation. And so what would happen is that in the first draft, where men between the ages of 21 to 30 were required to register, basically you would get up in the morning and you would go down to your polling place, you would register in front of the local board, but also in front of all your friends and neighbors. And communities had parades, they had fairs, they had festivals. The community was celebrating its men, showing that they were patriotic enough to register. And so a few years ago, I, did, I decided to do a project to look at the front pages of, of newspapers across the nation on June 5th, just to see how different communities handled this experience. And I just wanted to share a few of them with you. So these are, these are newspapers that come from different parts of the country. So this one comes from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and the other one comes from San Bernardino, California. I actually just met somebody before this who was born in San Bernardino, so that one will have special meaning for you. And you can see that this is a chain newspaper, so they're actually using the same illustrations. But what's important here is to realize that the government is not by itself in this process. All of the, the mass media of the time, newspapers being the primary way that people get their information, they're on board to help the government make this process a success. So if we look at these caricatures around the newspapers, they're quite interesting because what you're seeing here is, are men from all walks of life. And we know they're from all walks of life because the great signifier of what class you are, 
or what occupation you have at this moment in history is the kind of hat that you wear. And we can see all different kinds of hats here on, on these men. And as they get closer to Uncle Sam, they're not just waiting, they're running. They cannot wait to register for the draft. They're so happy and enthusiastic about it. This one I particularly like because, again, it's a little hard to see here, but there's actually a photograph under that headline of men lining up to register. So it's almost photographic evidence of what the character, character shows. And so we get a sense that it's local communities themselves that are volunteering to participate in this. It's not just the heavy hand of government coming in and saying you're going to register. Communities are self-mobilizing to do their bit. But I will have to say that in looking at these newspapers, um, this one is my absolute favorite. This is the Chicago Daily Tribune. And I love this headline. Enrolling Liberty Army. Patriots will register gladly. All others must. <laughs> That's it. That just sums it up. That's fantastic. <laughs> I also like this, this, uh, this um, front page because of the cartoon that we have here in the middle. And the cartoon in the middle is actually also very interesting because it starts to show us something important about the differences between the expectations that men have going into this army and the reality of what it's going to mean to serve in the First World War. So if we look at the top part of this, uh, this cartoon, it's very analogous to the ones that I just showed you. You have in this one, the men kind of on the other side of handing in their registration card. And here, remember, they were all different, all the different hats. They came from all different walks of life. And in this one, Uncle Sam is, is stamping them registered mail, kind of a pun on registered you know, mail with a letter. And, and as, they, as they walk off, they all look exactly the same. They all have the same hats, the same clothes. So you get that sense that you come in from all these different walks of life, but then you turn into a uniformed soldier, and you will, you will look very similar. But this is the part that I find also quite interesting. And here you have a judge. And a judge is actually speaking sternly to the men who did not show up. These are your draft dodgers, the people who are evading either registering or serving. And he's, he's pointing his finger at them, and he's telling them, uh, OK, so you haven't registered. So you will be sentenced to a year in prison. That's the penalty for refusing to register for the draft. After that, you will be put in the army. And not only will you be put in the army, but you will be dishonored by becoming stokers on ships, basically shoveling coal into the furnaces to keep the ships going. You will be dishonored by being assigned to a non-combatant position within the, the, the armed forces. This is a problem. And I'm going to explain to you why this is a problem. You have men who come from all over the country. And you, I'm telling you how these communities are mobilizing in support of the war. These men expect to fight. They're going to have experiences they've never had in their life. Many coming from rural areas. They're going to get on trains. They're going to travel across America, see places they never expected to see go to New York City, get on a ship, travel across to a foreign country, again, a place they never expected to see. And when they land in Brest, France, this is what they're going to see on the docks. And this is the other reality of fighting a mass industrialized war, which is that it is a huge logistical operation. You don't just need people in the front lines to fire rifles, machine guns, artillery. You also need a huge army of men behind the lines to support those frontline troops. And this, in a sense, was a new conception of what military service was going to mean. I gave you some numbers, 300,000 to 4.2 million men. I'm going to give you some other numbers. In the Civil War, 90% of soldiers were combatants. Most combatant labor was performed by civilians. But in the First World War, that number would drop to 40%. Only 40% of men would actually be considered or classified as combatant soldiers. That means 60% of your army are non-combatants. Now, these people could be in very specialized jobs, and they could certainly be exposed to danger by being non-combatants. But what they are going to do in the military is very different than what they expect to do. And if you've organized your draft process by basically devaluing non-combatant work, by saying it's a punishment 
for not stepping up and being willing to register, you've already put in people's minds the idea that it's, uh, you're doing something lesser by being in that non-combatant position. And this is going to create a lot of problems within the American military during the war because a lot of people are doing this work. And so we start to see a changing reality of military service that's not always conforming to the ideas that people have going in. And there's going to be no group for whom this disjunction is more significant than African American soldiers. African American soldiers, we have segregated military at this time, and 89% of African American soldiers will serve as non-combatants during the First World War. And often, those, not, those, those, those African American soldiers classified as non-combatants won't even get any farther than breast. And this is a photograph of African American soldiers who are stevedores, basically. They've been assigned to unload these ships, all these munitions, all these goods that are coming overseas from the United States in order to support the war. And again, if you take a closer look at this photograph, what you can see here are African American soldiers, almost in this kind of assembly line, uh, industrialized um, uh, um, uh, workplace in order to unload these ships. They have uniforms on, but over their uniforms are work overalls, almost to kind of suggest to them that nothing has changed for you by being in the military. You're doing the same kind of work that you would have done in civilian life, only now you're doing the military, and the person who's your foreman, the person who's your overseer, is a, is a white non-commissioned officer who's standing right behind. And so for a lot of African Americans, this would create a lot of, of, of unhappiness and dissatisfaction about what it meant to serve in the US military. But, but I should add, there was going to be something that was very different for these African American soldiers, and that was the fact of just being in France. Because by being behind the lines in Brest working, they also had opportunities to come into contact with French civilians. And they found in France that French civilians treated them quite differently than, than white Americans often did, especially in the South. And so one of the most predominant memories that we will see coming out of the First World War within the African American community is the memory of these positive experiences that they had with French civilians. And many, many men who would write home or speak afterwards about going to France and for the first time being uh, treated, they felt, like, Amer like Americans, truly feeling like they were now actually considered, uh, considered Americans by the French. So some important things that we see going on. Now I mentioned it's a total war and you have to raise your army. You have many jobs you need men to do. Um, you also have to mobilize your home front. And so there's a significant effort that's being put on mobilizing the American population. So we started with this one, which is all about raising men for the, for the army. But we can see in many ways this stern Uncle Sam for I want you for the army also morphing in to a stern Uncle Sam who's talking to civilians on the home front. And here's Uncle Sam, I'm telling you, on June 28th, I expect you to enlist in the army of war savers to back up my army of fighters. And this is giving us a sense that civilians on the home front also have to do their part. Now, often when we talk about propaganda posters, we kind of do it the way I'm doing it right now. We take one, we put it up on a screen, we dissect it, we sort of see it as a unique artifact. I want to suggest to you a different way to think about these propaganda posters. And one is to just think about literally overnight, the whole visual landscape of your society changing. Because that's what happens in the First World War. These posters were everywhere. There was nowhere you could go and not see them. And I mean nowhere. So here's some examples where we can see city landscapes changing, billboards being dominated about them. But those are not the only places where we're going to see these posters. Workplaces begin to change as well. These posters come into your workplace. This is an interesting phenomenon. Of course, one of the main things that people want, the government wants you to do, is to buy liberty bonds. You have these posters in your workplace, not just to encourage you individually to go out, but a lot of companies volunteer this kind of scenario. Payday comes, you line up, there's one desk here where you receive your money. And then right next to you is another desk where you can hand that money over and buy a Liberty Bond. 
all organized for you. You don't even have to think it through. So we see these posters on cityscapes. We see them in uh, offices. And we see them in schools. This is a classroom in Connecticut. These kids go to school, look up. The war does not leave them. These posters are on buses, they're in newspapers, they're everywhere. They're in telling you to conserve food, to buy Liberty Bonds, to knit. If this was uh, 1917, I'd be shouting over the sound of clicking knitting needles. You'd all be sitting here knitting right in front of me in order to show me that you're doing your patriotic duty. And showing people that you were actually participating in the war effort was an important part of this whole process. And so we had things like, like this, uh, um, things that were going to encourage you not just to do your duty, but also to see this as a way to join with your community and to really enjoy the experience of participating in the war effort. And I've shown you a lot of pictures of, of what I like to call mean Uncle Sam. Um, but I like this one, because this is like party Uncle Sam. This is, a, this is happy Uncle Sam, who says, you know, get on the Liberty Bond bus. This is fun. I mean, you're going to join with your neighbors. You're going to be part of something bigger than yourself, and you're going to enjoy the experience of doing that. And I think for a lot of people, that was meaningful. It was, it was something that really made the war moment an exciting moment to be living through, not just something to fear. And of course, just like in the conscription process, there was an element of peer pressure that was evident in this, in this scenario as well. And so we see a lot of things like this, like once you buy that Liberty Bond, put your name on the list. Once you buy that Liberty Bond, you'll have a button to wear, make sure everybody can see that you have it. And then of course our question could be, you know, what happens if your name's not on that list? What happens if you're not wearing that Liberty Bond? So here we can see that there's this kind of huge effort that's being put in to creating this army, excuse me, and mobilizing the home front. And it probably might be a good moment to step back and think, why is America doing this? Why is America putting all this effort into creating this army and mobilizing its home front resources in support of it? And in a sense, that's the question of why is America fighting this war? Now, this is a complicated question, and historians have pretty much debated it ever since. But at the moment, at least one person felt there was a crystal clear explanation to that question, or answer to that question, and that was Woodrow Wilson. So when Woodrow Wilson asked the country to go to war in April of 1917, he basically emphasized two, two things. The first was the importance of America fighting in this war for reasons of national self-defense that Germany, indeed, he had come to believe, represented a threat to the United States. And he had things that he could cite. He talked about the resumption of unrestricted submarine warfare, the fact that U-boats were going to be sinking American merchant vessels going to Europe, the fact that U-boats were now patrolling along American coasts. Um, he could also point to the Zimmerman telegram, the idea that Germany had made this overture to Mexico, kind of trying to induce Mexico to attack the United States, and then in return, then this, this was the idea of tying America down on its borders so it wouldn't be able to participate very fully in the, in the European war. And that this showed that Germany, in fact, had hostile intentions against America. So in the first part of his war address, he's really emphasizing the point of defending the country. But then in the second part, he gives America something else to fight for. And that is, and it kind of comes along with all the famous catchphrases that we associate with Wilson, the notion of this being the war to end all wars, the war to spread democracy, the notion that America, in fact, had a greater role to play in the history of the world than just defending its borders, that it could be the force for good. It could turn this terrible war where millions of people had died, for what, into a war that would actually have a transcending meaning, that it could reestablish a different international order and that this would be a way to a peaceful future. And it sounds idealistic to us now, but it was very inspiring for people at the time. And it was inspiring not just because Wilson said it, but because in many ways, Americans were ready to believe it. And here's where I think we often make a huge mistake when we study the American experience of the war. And I've made the same mistake. Because when I, talked, when I started my talk, 
I began in April of 1917. But in reality, that's not where we should start, especially if we want to understand why Americans responded so well to Wilson's vision. We need to go back to the period of neutrality, because in the period of neutrality, Americans did not stay outside the conflict. In fact, they were very involved. But they weren't involved as fighters. They were involved as humanitarians. And we tend to lose sight of just how important this food relief that Herbert Hoover uh, organized to provide food for northern France and for Belgium was. This was a massive humanitarian philanthropic relief effort, something which we haven't seen the scale of until the recent tsunami. And this involved all Americans, Americans of all walks of life that donated money, donated food, they donated help to help these civilians who were suffering in these occupied areas. And the reason that this was important was because, in a sense, giving this food aid had already conditioned Americans to believe that, that through their philanthropic efforts, they could indeed do good in the world. And not just that they could, but that their aid was wanted, that their help was wanted, that they were appreciated. And how did they come to that understanding? They came to it through the way that Belgians especially responded. And I wanted to show you this because a very interesting artifact. And in 1915, a community in Kansas, around Topeka, Kansas, I'm just using this as an example, sent a shipload of grain over to Belgium. And imagine their surprise a year later when those flour sacks that had held that grain came back. But they didn't come back asking to be refilled. Instead, they came back embroidered by Belgian women who were renowned for their, for their embroidery skills as presents, as thank yous, as a way to express their appreciation for what Americans had done. And these flower sacks went up in storefront windows, and people passed them every day and sort of knew that, 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 uh, that they had done something good and their aid was actually wanted. And so I would argue that this this experience in the period of 1914 to 1917 was very significant in terms of helping American soldiers especially embrace that notion that America had a different role to play in this war from the role that the, their allies were playing. Now, of course, there was also plenty of propaganda that emphasized the other aspect of Wilson's war, war message, and that was the aspect of, of, of needing to fight the Germans, seeing them as an enemy, and in a sense, sort of dehumanizing them. And so we have plenty of images and posters like this. Okay, so I've, I've made a big build up. Let's actually get over to France and get to the battlefield. So in the First World War, the United States, as I've said a few times now, enters relatively late in the war. And it'll take us about a year to really have an army that's capable of fighting along the Western Front. We, we have about six months of active fighting for the American Army, and we take over an American sector here. And you can see in some of those blue shaded uh, areas, these are the places where America does its most significant fighting. And its most significant battle is a battle called the Meuse-Argonne. The Meuse-Argonne, it's, I have to say, just kind of incredible. Um, to imagine that the Meuse Argonne is the, the second most lethal battle in American military history. I defy you to go out today and find a person on the street who has ever heard of it. It's my challenge for you. <laughs> uh, most people have never heard of the Meuse Argonne campaign, which is really tragic. It's a 47 day battle, 1.2 million men uh, fight in it. We have over, over 20,000 killed, 100,000 wounded. It's a significant part of American military history that most people don't know anything about. So we can think about it in that larger terms, but I wanted to really spend a few minutes by talking about it in more personal terms. And I wanted to talk about three, the experiences of three different individuals within the American Army, that American Army that I'm talking about, that fought in the Muser gun, and take a little bit of a look at their experiences. So the first person that I want to talk about is Alvin York. Maybe many of you have heard of Alvin York. Alvin York was a poor man. He was raised in Palmo, Tennessee. He, um, he became one of the most decorated American soldiers in the First World War. 
uh, fought in the Muser Gun Campaign, came home to great acclaim. But what a lot of people don't know about Alvin York is that, first of all, this is not Alvin York. <laughs> I was making you nervous there, wasn't I? <laughs> that maybe I didn't know my history. Um, no, this is Gary Cooper. Um, I think that's generational, maybe a generational joke. Some people got that, some people didn't. So this is Gary Cooper, who played Alvin York in a movie that was made about him in 1941. So it gives you the idea of just how famous he was, that 20 years afterwards he could still uh, have a blockbuster Hollywood film. Gary Cooper won Best Actor for playing Sergeant York. Um, he was really the most famous individual of the First World War. This is Alvin York. Um, so is Alvin York with his mother. Uh, Alvin York, however, had, had this very, he became very famous for his exploits in the Western Front. As I said, one of the most decorated soldiers. But he had begun his military service trying to become a conscientious objector. And he had filed a petition for, uh, based on his religious beliefs to get an exemption for military service because he said the Bible says thou shalt not kill, and he was refused. He gets drafted, he goes into the training camp, and luckily for him, he actually had a very sympathetic company commander who talked scripture with him. And so when Alvin York would say things like, thou shalt not kill, his company commander came back to him and said, yes, but the Bible also says, blessed are the peacemakers. And doesn't Woodrow Wilson say this is going to be the war to end all wars? Doesn't he say this will be the last war? And he convinces York to actually fight and serve. And so Alvin York, in a way, becomes his, he overcomes his doubts and fights, and fights valiantly. But his dilemma is something that concerns some progressive thinkers. And there's one man in particular who gets concerned about dilemmas like Alvin York's. And this is a man by the name of Roger Baldwin. Now, Roger Baldwin doesn't know York personally. But he does know that there are other men trying to become conscientious objectors during the war. And he forms an, an organization, the National Civil Liberties Bureau, where he tries to offer them legal advice, tries to help them actually pursue their claims. And he's not really that successful in terms of helping conscientious objectors. But he becomes concerned about this issue, and especially about the issue he links conscientious objection, in fact, to the issue of free speech and free thought. And he thinks and thinks and thinks about this. And in the post-war period, he's not ready to put it aside. And instead, he decides to create an organization dedicated to protecting American civil liberties. What is that organization? American Civil Liberties Bureau, which we still have with us today. So in some respects, one of the main organizations that we have that's on the forefront of protecting our civil liberties is, uh, is a direct result of the experiences during the First World War. Now, I have a second soldier I want to talk about uh, that I, don't susp I suspect you haven't heard of, and I don't expect you to have heard of him. And this is a man called Charles F. Minder. Minder comes from New York. He is also drafted. And he serves in a, in a, in a unit. He's a machine gunner. He serves in the 77th Division. And in his division, he serves alongside men from all walks of life. In fact, as does Alvin York. Alvin York also talks about the large numbers of men that he has in his unit who, in fact, don't even speak English. And this tells us something else very significant about the American Army during the First World War, which is that the Army is being formed at a time when America has just undergone this vast wave of immigration from Europe. A lot of men in America, men of draft eligible age, are immigrants. And so we see in the First World War that 20% of the Army is actually composed of foreign-born men. Immigration, immigrants in the Army, this is something that the Army has to confront and deal with. Now, Minder himself is American-born, but he's German-American. Very interesting scenario for him. He, as, a, as an American, a German-American, can be drafted. His mother, as a German immigrant, has to register as an enemy alien. She has to go down to the police station and be photographed, fingerprinted. This is not her. <laughs> this is just another card. <laughs> it's a, a different card. But she has to carry around that identification card with her at all times. And so imagine you're in this army, you're fighting, and he's very patriotic. He hates the German government. He's, he's happy to do his duty, but he's concerned about the home front. He's not afraid or he's not opposed to um, disposing the German army. But he's very concerned about who he's actually fighting against on the other side, because he knows that he has uncles and cousins who are in the German army on the other side. And he becomes almost obsessed 
with this idea that he might accidentally kill one of them. And in that, I was showing the cover of the book, that was the earlier image, because he, he reprints, he publishes that, he reprints the letters he sends to his mother over the course of the war. And he writes over these letters, where he sort of calls this, 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 this nightmare he keeps having. And one day on the battlefield, he's actually in combat, in during the Musar gun campaign, he takes out a German machine gun nest and he starts walking towards these two uh, German soldiers who are lying on the ground. And for some reason, as he begins walking up to them, he becomes just, just sort of fixated on the notion that he's, he's going to, this nightmare is actually going to become reality. And there's a man alive on the ground, and he looks into his eyes and asks him, are you my Uncle Franz? And the man can't talk, and he just looks at him and smiles, and Minder holds his hand while he dies. Now, he wasn't his uncle, but at that moment, he says, why am I killing these people? Maybe I don't like the German government, but why do, why do these people have to die as a result? And so Minder, when he prints that book, has by that point become a pacifist and has joined the peace movement. And it's going to be stories like this and, and, and experiences like this that make the peace movement in the United States in the 1920s and the 1930s extremely powerful and strong. We are wrong to think that the only time we've ever had a significant peace movement is during the 1960s. In some respects, the peace movement in the 1920s and 30s was even stronger and more significant. Think about how they were able to impact the debate over America entry into World War II much later in the 1930s. So another direct legacy that we have of the First World War. Now the third story that I want to talk about is uh, Horace Pippin. And Horace Pippin is an African-American soldier and he's one of those 11% that serves as a combatant. He's a Harlem Hellfighter. He's a very famous regiment that, uh, that, that's very well known. It serves the longest in the line of any American regiment. They come home with Croix de Guerre. They're feted. They do extremely well in all the battles that they fight. How do they do that? Well, they're one of four regiments that Pershing gives to the French army. These are African Americans who don't fight under American command in the Meuse-Argonne campaign. They actually fight as integral parts of the French army. Now, Pippin himself has a kind of traumatic ending to his military experience, again, in the Meuse-Argonne campaign. He goes into battle during the assault on Seychelles. He's shot in the right shoulder. He falls into a shell hole. A friend of his stops, binds his wound, but then has to keep going. Pippin is losing blood, he's very weak. He, he has this idea of crawling out of the shell hole and going back for help, but every time he puts his head up to, to crawl out, there's a German sniper who has spotted him, who shoots at him and he falls back down. So finally he gives up, he says, okay, I'm just gonna have to lie here and wait for help. And it seems like help's arrived a few hours later when a French soldier sees him. And, and the French soldier literally comes up, Pippin is lying down, looks down at him, and Pippin is just about to say to him, watch out for the sniper, when the sniper gets him through the head and this French soldier falls and falls right on top of Pippin. So now he's shot, he's lost blood, he's weak, and he has his corpse on top of him and lies like that for the next 10 hours. Pretty traumatic experience but he's able to find some salvation in it because he reaches into the man's pocket and pulls out some bread and water that the man was carrying and feels that in this kind of ironic way, this man might have saved his life. So he comes home and he's never able to, um, to gain full use of his arm again. But there's something else I didn't tell you about Pippin that's going to actually be probably the most significant part of the story. And that, that was Pippin was an artist and he was a self-taught artist. And throughout the war, he didn't write letters home to his mother, he drew. And he drew sketches of his experiences. But in going into this last battle, because of the soldiers having to basically divest themselves of anything extraneous, he'd had to burn them all. And so he'd come home with none of the art that he had created, and this kind of trauma that he was trying to process. And so he, he, he sat with it and sat with it and sat with it, and finally, after a few years, he began to paint. And you have an interesting picture here because of his injury. You can see how he had to learn to paint again. And so what he would do is he had the paintbrush and you put it in his hand and he would move his hand like this in order to paint on the canvas. And so he spent three years on this picture. Um, it's called The End of the War Starting Home. 
And it's, it's very, it's really too bad that it's so washed out here. But if you, I would just encourage if you ever have a chance to see this painting that you take advantage of it. Three years of putting paint on a canvas, it's almost like a sculpture in terms of the texture of what he's got. And what you have here is, you know, death and destruction everywhere. But besides, though, thank you. <laughs> besides the death and destruction, um, and again, it's very vague here, you have, you have the men of his unit, the African-American soldiers, who are taking the surrender from the Germans. And so Pippin is really processing two things here. He's processing the trauma of combat on just a personal level. But he's also painting an image that is a direct, a direct answer to that earlier image I showed you of the black stevedores under white command. In this image, it's black soldiers who are showing that they have the valor, the bravery, the discipline to be victorious against the Germans. There's not a white officer in sight. And so in a certain sense, uh, Pippin is coming home and through his art, really talking on two levels about the importance of the First World War. Pippin himself becomes very famous. There are retrospectives to him all the time. I encourage you to do more to find out about his art. But this image of, of black bravery and valor is also part of a campaign that many black veterans come home engaged in. And these are black veterans who, who join the civil rights movement. They become very concerned when America is going to fight a second world war that the similar experiences they had are not repeated. And so I don't have a lot of time to go into it, but I'm just going to say this. If we look at the American military today, and we think about the American military as an, as an organization that offers equal opportunity to all, we really have to pay our due to the World War I generation because they were the ones who initiated through their political um, uh, activism a campaign to open more and more opportunities up to African American soldiers through the 20th century. And so yet another way that we see how we're living with the legacy of the First World War. Now just one last quick thing to say and then um, I'd be really happy to hear your questions and comments. And so the other important legacy of the First World War is through another organization that we have, the American Legion. American Legion is about to celebrate its 100th anniversary because it was created in 1919 by World War I veterans. So we get some very interesting organizations, ACLU, American Legion, all sorts of different things out of the First World War. So the American Legion is created, and this is an organization initially just for World War I veterans. And the American Legion is very concerned about veterans' affairs. Uh, they remember, too, especially in the early years, how these great parades sent men off, and they become concerned about the lack of preparation for welcoming these men home. And you can kind of see that in this image here. And in 1924, they begin a campaign for something they call adjusted compensation. And this is basically a bonus that they want paid to World War I soldiers, arguing that by going in the military, they had lost out in many financial opportunities to get ahead during the war. They would argue, for example, workers that stayed at home got paid very high wages, war profiteers, industrialists made high profits, and American soldiers who served got paid very little, come home, and all those opportunities have evaporated. And so in the short term, they get this, this uh, adjusted compensation certificate in 1924. They add, this is a compromise. It's supposed to be a 20-year payment. They get, the, they get a bond that'll be payable in 20 years. You may have heard of the bonus march. They agitate during the Great Depression to get paid earlier. They finally do in 1936. But the real thing that I want you to take away is not the intricacies of the adjusted compensation or bonus march, but something that I bet everybody has heard of, the GI Bill of Rights. And so I'm just going to end with this, because again, love to learn lessons from history. Well, the American Legion learned a lesson from history, and their lesson was the government spent so much time thinking about mobilizing the army, it never thought about how it was going to treat these people or welcome them home. And that, in a sense, ended up being a much more important failure of the government's, on the government's part for these men in their individual lives. So in World War II, we have millions more men coming into the military, many of these men serving the sons of these World War I veterans. And they say to themselves, we're not going to make that same mistake. So when we think of the GI Bill of Rights, which is created in 19, 1944, it's the American Legion that writes that legislation. It's the American Legion that lobbies for its passage. And it's the American Legion that helps publicize its benefits and even decides what those benefits are going to be. And so you can see, and I don't think anybody disputes, that the GI Bill of Rights has been a huge transformative piece of legislation in American history.
It turned America, in many respects, into a middle class society. And so we really see in that sense one generation giving to, giving to the other. And so I think I've given you a lot of reasons, I hope, for why World War I really matters in American history. But I think that one of the final reasons we can honestly say is that perhaps one of the most significant pieces of social welfare legislation we've ever had is also a direct legacy of the First World War. Great. Well, thank you so much for your attention, and I, I hope you have some questions. So now we're going to pretend like we're sitting in a living room, <laughs> just having a conversation. Um, and uh, you're all invited to come up um, and ask a question. I'm not sure exactly what time it is. I'm not checking my text messages. But we've got about 15 minutes. It's interesting that you ended on the GI Bill. Um, many of us have family members that mm -hmm. went to college on the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. My dad won. That probably reshaped America as much as anything, didn't absolutely. it? Absolutely, absolutely. I would just say, and what's interesting too about um, this generation of World War veterans in terms of how far sighted they were, if you had had a similar GI Bill, say, you know, tuition to go to college for the first World War generation, hardly anybody could have used it. Um, you had a high literacy rate, many people hadn't even finished high school, it just didn't really, that was not the kind of thing they would have needed. But because education is, um, has really changed by the time of the World War II generation, then the idea of actually having the ability to go to school, and not just a four-year college, but a lot of technical schools as well, agricultural schools, that made much more sense for that generation than it would have meant. And I just did an event um, for the American Legion a few weeks ago in LA, and, and that, of course, the idea of the GI Bill and what we want from it has changed dramatically. And one of the things that the Legion hears from its members now that most people want is the ability to pass those benefits on to their children. That, in fact, veterans are more concerned about paying for their children's tuition and, and cost of college than, than themselves um, going back to school. So each generation has sort of its own issues. It shows you it's not never a one size fits all. You need to be thinking about what each generation of veterans might be needing in terms of, of, of help readjusting and, uh, and going on with their lives. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got our first question, Alan. In, turn, in terms of speaking about lessons learned from World War I, I wonder if you um, have any comments that you would care to share about the impact of the Treaty of Versailles as a mm -hmm. causative factor mm -hmm. in World War II. Mm -hmm. So the Treaty of Versailles, of course, the United States has not ratified the Treaty of Versailles, and we do not join the League of Nations. So in many ways, we, it seems as if we turn away from Woodrow Wilson's ideas of what the war had been about. But I think we overlook the ways in the 1920s, especially, that, that Republicans and Democrats, because we have Republican administrations in the 1920s, that these Republican administrations also, in fact, embrace aspects of Wilson's vision and try to realize them in different ways. So the U.S. does not pull back from the world in the 1920s. We're very engaged in um, disarmament treaties, in trade agreements. We try to make the reparation schedules work. Um, but it's the Depression that really pulls us back into the, into the First World War. So I would have to say that I'm not one of these people that blames the Versailles Peace Treaty for World War II. I think you have 20 years of decision making. And, and if I had to pick anything as the sort of causal factor, I would blame the Depression before I blamed the Versailles Peace Treaty. Because it was the Depression that caused America to really pull back into isolationism, erect high tariffs, not disengage from political affairs in Europe because of all the problems we were having at home. And so I think that that, that in many respects, is more significant, understanding um, American foreign policy than, um, than just failures of the, of the Versailles Peace Treaty, per se. But didn't the Germans see the Treaty of Versailles as very impressive as one of the stimulus of It was certainly true. It was certainly true. But American money in the 1920s was really appeasing the Germany's con Germany constantly in that. So every time Germany was having trouble with finances, America was coming over and helping them out. Suddenly in the 1920s, that American involvement is gone. It does, you're right, give Hitler a very easy way to 
talk to people about the daily struggles of their lives, connect it to the Versailles Peace Treaty, and kind of use that to great propaganda effect in the, in the war. Absolutely, absolutely. But see, why do we have to talk about World War II? Let's talk about World War I. <laughs> I'm looking for the, oh. interested in the team of people that created this messaging mm -hmm. and made it uh, so broadly disseminated yeah. across the country. Who were they and what kind of budget did they have? Yes. Well, sky's the limit in terms of budget. They certainly had. So this was a committee on public information. This was also a very brand new idea that the government was going to create a centralized propaganda agency, essentially, that we had never had anything like that before. But where do you go for the experts who can come in and actually you know, create this propaganda and also know how to do it effectively and disseminate it? And they turn to private industry. So it does matter that in the United States, we've already had the creation of sort of public relations as a field of advertising, of graphic design. It's very well established in the United States. And so these professionals are brought into the government to basically you know, take the same skills that they have and, and use them in terms of selling a different message. And just to compare it to Germany, there's, there's actually, Germany did not have that. So if you look at German propaganda in the First World War, it's terrible. It's just really not, um, it doesn't pull you in at all. And we, I, I, I've talked to a friend of mine who was doing some work on this, and he said, you know, you have these government meetings where they're just, in, they're just incensed. They say, well, you cannot sell war like you sell toothpaste. I mean, it's just insulting to them that you would use the same techniques. So fast forward to World War II, and you've seen World War II German propaganda. Hitler, in a sense, learned that lesson. They learned to become very effective propagandists. But that showed you how, that's how America was able to draw on some strengths within its civilian society in a way that other, other nations couldn't. You know, building on that, I, I have a campaign button collection. Yes. I should have brought my Wilson button. You should have worn it. Today. I should have worn it today. But it has, he kept us out of the war. That's right. This was his re-election yes. campaign. Yes. And it's shortly after he won on a campaign that he kept us out of the war. Yes. He takes us back. That's right. That takes a lot of propaganda to... Oh, to reverse that. To reverse Absolutely. that. Absolutely. 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 America was so happy to not be in the war. Yes. And then all of a sudden they're so happy to be in the war. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, that, and that's, and I didn't really talk about this, but there was also a very negative component going on here. So that we did have uh, sedition laws that were passed during the First World War as well. So there was the sort of, I'm, the propaganda aspect, the encouragement, the voluntary part, the way in which we're really going to entice you to join into this larger um, campaign. But the government also did increase its police powers. And so you did have first an Espionage Act that made it illegal to interfere with the operation of the draft. And that was interpreted by the Supreme Court as being just uh, disagreeing with it. So if you, know, the, the, you think of the very famous Shank versus U.S. case, this is a pamphlet that says uh, conscription is, 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 it violates the 13th Amendment because it's slavery. And, you know, kind of crazy thing to say, but, you know, he's arrested and, and convicted. So you have a, a coercive aspect going on here as well. So where dissent is criminalized. And so you, you make sure that you have um, support that way as well. There's both those things, the Selective Service Act, the Espionage Act, and the creation of the Committee on Public Information are all happening in May and June of 1917. It's all part of the same, the same picture. Yeah. I'm curious about the veterans who were um, traumatized in, in uh, yeah. World War I and what America did to uh, provide for them when they returned. Right. So one of the other um, important legacies of the First World War is the veterans' health care system as we know it that did not exist in the same way. And so the idea that you were going to perhaps need to create, per, you know, have a permanent medical care for veterans was a brand new idea. We'd had these soldiers' homes, which are sort of places where Civil War veterans, when, you know, if they just couldn't care for themselves, could go. But the notion that disability could be a lifelong thing that people were dealing with, and, and you correctly 
pointed to the two major, there are two major types of disability that World War I soldiers will face. And the first one you pointed to, which is shell shock, the sort of trauma um, that's ongoing. And the second one is gas-related uh, gas illnesses, so gas-related tuberculosis. So if you look at veterans' hospitals, these new veterans' hospitals that get created in the 20s, the majority of patients there are either there for so-called shell shock issues or gas-related tuberculosis. And so this was, these were the two main, main um, problems that veterans had. So this was, this was ongoing, and in some respects, I think that this is a bit of an untold story about the First World War, because not so much the veterans' health care system, but how the families of these veterans coped with, with, with their homecoming, because the primary care that these veterans would receive would be in the home still. And you, know, you can think of what that did to a family to have somebody. You get the anecdotal story, but it's hard to really piece that together in terms of a general portrait. But yeah, very important. Yes. I really appreciated your um, presentation. It was the most scintillating conversation, I mean, that, I, that I've ever heard taught about using pictures to illustrate, you know, the history because I'm obviously, I was born in 1954, but I served 26 years mm -hmm. in the military. And, and I'm a recipient of the mm -hmm. GI's benefits. Mm -hmm. I mean, they paid for all my college. I came from nine Excellent. children in the family, and and um, I was. They paid for all my degrees: mm -hmm. associates, bachelors, masters, and. Um, but one of the things that that um, I wanted to talk about was, you mentioned there was three hundred thousand, and they went to four point five uh, million. Mm -hmm. So what happened to the infrastructure in the United States? Who took care of everything? That the that the GI or the the man normally took care of, not not to be sexist. But you mean when they, when soldiers left, when they and, left. and suddenly yeah, the, and wasn't suddenly there a vacuum? in the home front? Certainly, I mean, again, it's something I didn't have time to talk about. They did only give me 35 minutes, and I think I took <laughs> close to 45. So, but um, but the changing roles for women was was dramatic as well. And so we think about absolutely that women were definitely having, as you said, to step into new roles. I've um, and we think often of you know the kind of Rosie the Riveter idea, women going into factories. But I think you've hit on more what, what more women experience was so suddenly new responsibilities that they had and new ways about raising children on their own or raising our family budgets. Um, a lot of most of the men who were serving were single. A lot of women worried they were not going to find husbands. That this was you know that this whole generation was going to be gone. So you'd certainly see a transformation for, for women. I read this amazing correspondence between a husband and wife in the First World War, and he didn't want to give up that control. And he made her send him like in, in monthly budgets, an accounting of the money that he was doing in. And a, I had one of my classes read these letters, and the women in the class were so mad at this guy. They just they couldn't stand it. But, but, but Kidding aside, the other, of course, hugely significant thing that comes out of the First World War is that all the women in this room can vote as a result of the First World War because the 19th Amendment is ratified in the 1920s. And so the suffrage movement is very important in terms of how it, it uses the war and the moment of the war to, to, to close the deal on female suffrage. So absolutely, the women's experience is essential. Can I build on this question really fast? Because this is an interesting concept. What happens to all of the people um, underrepresented or marginalized? Mm -hmm. um, so we've, World War II, the men all go to fight. Mm -hmm. The women all take their places. So then what happens when the men come back? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, in World War II, though, the women leave. I mean, those jobs, they're, they're told, those jobs and, the, and, and Legally, those jobs are preserved for veterans coming back. So if you look at the statistics in terms of the, the number of women who stay in the workforce, it, it, dram it drops dramatically. But even that with World War II, we have to be a little careful because in, in reality, most of the women who work in World War II are not new workers. They've been working. They just move into jobs traditionally held by men. They move into better jobs. But they're not necessarily women who are just newly entering into the workforce. Um, in other words, a lot of married women don't work in World War II. They're concerned about the things women with children are always concerned about. Who's going to raise my children? And I don't want to leave them with strangers. So, so that doesn't really happen. 
But in, um, in World War I, there's, there's some women that go into factories, not nearly this, you don't have nearly the same, the same numbers in terms of women working in industry. It seems like war ends up being a vehicle for social mobility. Yes. That, this is how I, I phrase it, because I've thought a lot about this, actually, and, um, and just I finished an article on, the, on this topic. I think what it is is it's not necessarily a war. It's when you have people who can utilize war as an opportunity to make things change. So I put an emphasis not on war, but on the people and the activists, the leadership. So the suffrage movement is a perfect example of that. Yes, we needed women in the war, but you needed those female suffrage leaders to be saying to the public, the, you cannot expect us to have the responsibilities of citizenship with none of the rights. Right? If they weren't there making that argument, just the war or the war moments would not have changed anything for them. That they had to seize the opportunity, the moment, to, to message that, that this was wrong and, and, people, and get people to listen to it. Did the African-American soldier come home with greater expectations? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. So this is just, a, again, a, a movement that's completely transformed by the war. If we think about the civil, the civil rights movement before World War I, which is much more oriented around Booker T. Washington's idea of, you know, we've got to work our way up economically, and then we'll ask for political rights. The NAACP was a new organization. It had just created in 1909. It, it could have easily disappeared. But these veterans come home and in large numbers join the NAACP and sort of overnight it becomes the most important civil rights organization in the United States with a very different attitude. And again, that was not inevitable. It didn't have to happen. And a lot of these, we think of Charles Houston, who is the architect of Brown versus Board of Education. He is the one who devised the NAACP's legal strategies for that campaign. And he was a World War I veteran. And he writes in his memoirs, I, 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 I was in this war. I saw how unjustly we were treated, especially poor African Americans. He was educated. And he said, I decided I'm going to fight for those people who can't fight back, and, and joined and became an activist. So I think the political, um, consci what do I say, the political awakening uh, or transformation that key individuals go through makes an important difference in terms of initiating change. You really don't have to have everybody going through the tra same transformation. If you have inspired leaders that go through that, they become, in a sense, the people that can generate a lot of change in America. Yes. Oh, the microphone's right there. Yeah. Make it easier. One of the things I noticed about your wonderful presentation was that the press was very cooperative oh, with the government. Right. That's right. And uh, a few years ago at a special program at Brigham Young University, I heard an editor, a deputy editor of Foreign Affairs for the New York Times, mm -hmm. who was on damage control when it was discovered that reporters from the New York Times had been making up stories as they went along. And it wasn't confined just to the press. Mm -hmm. There was a prominent anchor that went down under the same thing, oh, right. but this editor said something that alarmed me, and he was uncomfortable in acknowledging it. He said, we must tell things as we see them, even if it endangers U.S. soldiers. Hmm. How do we deal with that? Hmm. What's the lesson that we ought to have learned out of World War II mm -hmm. versus what's gone on with the War of Terror and some of the others. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that was certainly not the attitude of the press in World War I or World War II, or even the beginning of the Vietnam War. Again, the Vietnam War is a long war, and it takes the press a long time before it begins to really turn against the war. If you look at press coverage really up to 1966, it's very positive. So, so certainly the attitude of the press has changed in that, in that respect. I think that the question we have to ask ourselves, and this is a difference between what kind of war are we in? I mean, when you're in the First World War, Second World War, even the Korean War, there's a sense that war is an unusual period in American life. It's going to begin, but it's also going to end. When we're in a war in terror, 
Is this just a permanent state of being? Is this really a war that can be over? Um, and so in that sense, if we suggest that the press should be um, helping whatever administration it is in terms of delivering its message as its primary goal, rather than, as you're sort of saying, see it as we, as we, as, as we do, then that can be a question about whether or not freedom of the press will end in America. Because if this is the way we are permanently going to live, what role does the press have? Now, that's completely different from saying we don't care if we endanger American lives. I mean, I'm not, I'm not at all suggesting that that's an, an appropriate answer to, to any, any question. But it does give us a question. It does, it does ask us, you know, when we say we want to look at when lessons, we're, I think, in, in some respects, in a very unique situation in our history about if, if we are in a moment of perpetual war, uh, which we certainly have been in for quite a long time, and where is the end? Can we just put aside civil liberties in the way that we kind of accepted in earlier periods because we believed that, that to be temporary? Will this now end up being permanent because we will, we will be in the situation for the foreseeable future? <coughs> I, I don't have an answer to this. I just think that it's an interesting, an interesting thing for us to think about. Well, happily, we've gone over time. We hope that uh, you're OK <laughs> with that. I think this could go on for days. This is so interesting. <laughs> The war lasted longer than 35 minutes in your presentation. It did, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I knew that would be my big challenge. Well, happily, um, the purpose of a university is not to give everyone the knowledge they need to have, but rather to inspire them to keep learning. And uh, hopefully you've all been uh, motivated to learn more about World War I and its impacts and all of the kind of things. And we invite you to um, come on outside the room, and there are some books that you can grab. Um, and some artifacts in the back. And some artifacts in the back. So we'll continue this discussion. Thank you so much, Great. Dr. King. Thank you. Thank you.